All right, hello everyone. Let me get my presentation going. This is Miss Merritt. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about homeostasis at the organ level and the organ system level. So by now, your teacher or me should have um, taught you and you should have learned about the cell membrane. So how the cell at the cellular level maintains homeostasis and as well as the tissue level, how each tissue, a group of cells, works together to maintain homeostasis. And now we're looking at the organ and the organ system level. So notice here that it says cooperation makes it happen. So we're going to look to see how the organs work together to keep us healthy. So just a quick review, what is homeostasis? This is the ability of every single living thing, even bacteria, to maintain the same internal conditions. So we know that there are plenty of stimuli in the environment. This is stimuli is anything that can cause a response. Why it's important to maintain homeostasis is so that we remain within our tolerable limits Otherwise, we will not be able to function properly. And if that's the case, then that's when we get sick or when we have disease, even chronic disease. So let's look at some examples of things that need to be kept within certain range. Body temperature, blood pressure, making sure the oxygen, carbon dioxide can get to every single cell in your body so they can function properly blood pH level that goes back to the oxygen and CO2 levels within the blood, glucose levels within the blood, and osmoregulation, so the water within our body. And once again, you should have already learned about osmosis with the cell membrane, so how water moves down the concentration gradient across a membrane. So let's look at how homeostasis works. Homeostasis works by means of feedback mechanisms. So there's the different structures and the different systems within our body must work together, they must cooperate to keep our entire organism within the normal ranges. So there's two different types that we'll talk about in a moment, positive feedback and negative feedback. Um, just a little preview here, negative feedback occurs more often. That's a good hint for when you're working on your, um, your practice sheet. And this allows the baseline to be regained. Highlight this and put a star. That is your big clue when you're reading those examples on there. If it is a negative feedback mechanism, it's returning the body back to its baseline. So we'll take a, a closer look at that. In a moment. Negative feedback mechanisms also conserve energy as well as cellular materials. All right, so the key players in homeostasis within our body are the endocrine system and the nervous system. So the endocrine system, the most important thing you need to know here is that it produces hormones that regulate a lot of body processes, which we'll take a look at in the next slide, I think. And feedback mechanisms are needed to control hormone secretions used to regain an internal balance. And once again, I'll have some examples for you. The nervous system plays a big role as well because it sends out messages to the body to elicit or begin a response to stimuli. So first, looking at the endocrine system, notice that there is the pineal gland, pituitary gland, thyroid gland, working your way down from head to toe. There's a lot of different glands happening here. That's what the endocrine system is. It's the series of glands within our body. And if you look over here, this is what they control. So they regulate metabolism, water, mineral balance, growth, behavior, basically everything here is almost our entire body. 
and how it functions. Glands, pancreas, um, specialized cells in the brain, the heart, the stomach, as well as other organs. So the big thing that you need to know for the endocrine system is that it's a series of glands and they pretty much controls everything our body does. So just like the nervous system, which you may, may be more familiar with, the endocrine system carries messages, but instead of electrical messages such as the nervous system, endocrine system uses hormones, highlight hormones. Hormones are chemical signals that are they're, they're molecules that are chemical signals. So they travel through the body in the blood and each hormone affects only certain kinds of cells, and those cells are called target cells. Highlight this. So target cells are um, the ones, let me find it here. Target cells are the cells that have the matching receptor that perfectly fits the hormone. So it's very similar to when we're learning about enzymes and their substrate. This is a similar thing with target cells and they have a receptor and those receptors perfectly fit the hormones that are released. Okay. Um, when the hormone binds to the receptor, that causes a chain reaction and then it, it signals or causes a change within the cell. So long story short, endocrine system releases hormones that only target certain cells. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's just an overview. Most hormones are regulated by feedback mechanisms. The endocrine system produces and secretes hormones that regulate many body processes. Same thing, just a little bit shorter sentences there for you. All right, so now let's take a look at negative feedback. This occurs when your systems need to slow down or completely stop a process that is happening. Highlight those bold words. Slow down or completely stop a process. So this uses various receptors and effectors to bring about a reaction to keep our body favorable, to maintain homeostasis, in other words. So a receptor, and you need to know what these things are, a receptor is a structure that monitors internal conditions, so it can be something internal. It senses changes and initiates a response, usually by sending signals to the brain. So this would be part of the nervous system. Think if you have your hand and you're touching a hot stove, your skin is the receptor because it's sensing a change. It's sending that signal, oh my gosh, it's really hot, I should probably move my hand, right? It's really hot. The brain tells the muscles in your hand, now we're down to the effectors. The muscles are the effectors. The brain signals to those muscles to contract and to move your hand away from that hot stove. So the receptor is our skin. It's sending a signal to our brain. The effector is what effect does that have? Does that message have? In my example, the muscle cells were contracting to Preserve your hands from getting burned. The effectors could as well be organs or any other structures that receive signals from the brain. So here is a model showing negative feedback. It might look overwhelming at first, but let's just take a look. So if you cover up the bottom half, only look at the top, we have our normal factor. So this is the way it's supposed to be. Look at my mouse. If, let's say, your body temperature increases, there are receptors that will say, oh wow, I'm getting hot. 
the brain will tell the glands in the skin, the sweat glands, to correct the response. That corrective response would be to sweat, and then that would take the temperature down to normal once again. So even though the arrow is going up, because the temperature increased, it's still bringing it back to the baseline. So this center line is baseline. That's the normal. That's what we want to keep. Okay, so now move it so your hand is covering the top. Only, or um, Yes, so only look at the bottom. We're not looking at the top anymore. So now over here, if you have a factor norm, this is your baseline. 98.6 degrees is our normal temperature. Let's say that we get cold, so the temperature decreases. Our receptors say, oh wow, we're cold. <laughs> the effectors, which would be our muscles in this case, would say, okay, let's do something about it. The corrective response would be to shiver and for our hair to raise, get goosebumps. And then that would cause our body temperature to go back up to the factor norm again. So it's still going back to the baseline. Okay, that's the big thing with negative feedback. It's going back to normal. So two examples here. When you eat your food, um, it, the food travels down to your stomach, digestion begins. We don't want our stomach working all the time. It takes a lot of energy. So the digestive um Enzymes and digestive juices and the muscles in the stomach can rest when we're not eating. So the digestive system works with a series of hormones and nerve impulses to stop and to start the secretion of acids in your stomach. So you can see here that the fact that the digestive system rests while we are not eating, that's conserving energy. The moment you put food in your mouth, that sends a series of hormones and nerve impulses to start the digestive system working. When it's done, it will return back to its resting state. Okay, and so it's returning back to its baseline. Example two um, is what I already gave you. So this is with uh, a rise in temperature, sweating is the corrective response, and so our body temperature can go back to normal. So here's just another model to look at um, using body temperature. So if the body temperature rises, that's our stimulus, the receptors in our, um, in our skin, or I don't know, other parts of the body, body temperatures, body's temperature sensors, usually in our skin, signal, they send the signal to the brain saying, oh my gosh, we're hot, why are we so hot? And then the brain says, ah, and then it goes to the effectors. I hope you like my sound effects. <laughs> then it goes to the effectors, the blood vessels widen and they swell and they get closer to the surface of the skin so that heat can radiate out as well as the sweat glands in the skin are activated and so we sweat okay and then homeostasis is restored so our body temperature can go back to normal this is saying the same thing as that other one that I had you cover up it's just a different method different model I don't know what your brain likes better Okay, so the third example, and I believe this one's on your test. Okay, so after, and this is still with negative feedback. After you exercise, you feel thirsty because of the drop of water content in your blood. The hypothalamus, part of the endocrine system, senses this and signals the pituitary gland, also part of the endocrine system, to release ADH, antidiuretic hormone. ADH reduces the water content of the urine, so your body's holding on to the water. The hypothalamus senses the level in the blood is back up after you drink uh, 
a glass of water, and signals the pituitary gland to stop making the ADH, the antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so the, the corrective response here was to hold on to the water by um, not letting that go out of the bladder. So it was more concentrated urine. So write this down. It returns to baseline conditions. You're going back to normal by doing this. All right, so now let's look at positive feedback. Positive feedback, you'll know after when you read an example that it's positive feedback, and I'd highlight this, because it encourages a process or amplifies the action of something. So positive feedback is cyclic process. So it just goes over and over and over. Highlight this. It's a cyclical process that can continue to amplify your body's response to a stimulus until a negative feedback response takes over. And this is less common. So when you read the examples, or if you're reading a question on a test, if the example is making something go faster, 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 you'll know it's positive feedback. All right, so um, example one, your stomach normally secretes a compound called pepsinogen that is in an inactive enzyme. As your body converts pepsinogen to the enzyme pepsin, that's the helpful one, it triggers the process that helps convert other pepsinogen molecules to pepsin. This cascade effect occurs and soon your stomach has enough pepsin molecules to digest proteins. So once when once <laughs> once one pepsinogen molecule is converted, then it's it's like a waterfall effect. One more and one more and one more and two more and then four more and then eight more until your proteins in your stomach are digested. Okay. Example number two is looking at when you get a cut, the your cells produce an enzyme called thrombin to help blood clotting. The production of thrombin causes, again, more and more and more thrombin to be produced. This is really helpful because then our blood clots faster and faster. Okay, we don't want to wait there all day for enough thrombin to be produced. We want it to be as quickly as possible so that we can seal our body um, so we don't bleed out. All right, the third example, and I believe this one's on your test, so put a star next to this one, is childbirth. So where's number one? So the head of the fetus pushes against the cervix. Here's the cervix right here. And that pressure causes nerve impulses to be transmitted to the brain. The brain stimulates the pituitary gland to make oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone. Oxytocin is carried in the bloodstream to the uterus. Remember the uterus is a sac of muscles that's going to squeeze this baby out. Okay, So oxytocin goes to the uterus and the oxytocin causes contractions or that bag of muscles to contract and to squeeze, which pushes the baby's head down even more. And then you can see how this goes around and around. So this is good because we want the baby to come out. Okay, so that's why labor usually starts pretty slow. And then as the uterus keeps pushing on the cervix, that will cause more and more and stronger and stronger contractions until the baby is out. And then at that point, the body is returned to homeostasis. All right, so that was negative and positive feedback. Now let's look at how an imbalance of homeostasis could cause disease. Highlight these, these you need to know for your test. So disease, and cellular malfunction can be caused in these two ways, deficiency, 
So the cell's not getting what they need to properly function. Or toxicity and or toxicity. So toxicity is the cells being poisoned by the things that they do not need. So again, if we look back at the cell membrane and how things get into and out of the cell, that's really what we're looking at. That's why we started with the cell membrane. So if the things are not getting into the cell by means of diffusion, by facilitated diffusion, or by active transport, you're gonna have a deficiency. If they can't get out, you're gonna have toxicity. Influence your ability to maintain homeostasis. We have internal influences like genetics, we have type 1 diabetes, predisposition to heart disease, as well as some cancers. And remember, you can change your genetics based on your life choices, which is amazing. We also have external influences, uh, environmental exposure, like drug toxins, your lifestyle choices, your diet. If you're lacking in essential vitamins and minerals, that's going to cause a deficiency, like the previous slide discussed. Um, anemia is an example of this. So iron deficiency, which affect oxygen content. And physical activity is the other lifestyle choice. So if, are you getting adequate sleep and adequate exercise? All right, so that looks about it. Um, if you have any questions, please ask your teacher or you can email if we're not there for, to help you at this moment. Um, I hope that is clear. Please make sure you got all of the highlights so you know um, what will be on the exam.